Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Grung Week in Review. This show is being recorded on Monday, October 18th, 2021. I'm Asbet Bedrosian, and along with Hovik Manucharyan, this week we're going to talk about the following major topics. A flurry of diplomatic activity, results from Tavush, Shirak, and Sunik, vaccination in Armenia, and trust in the authorities about information from the border areas. And we have Hrant Mikhailian this week to talk about these issues with us. Hrant is a political scientist and multidisciplinary researcher in social sciences at the Caucasus Institute based in Yerevan. Hello and welcome everyone. Hello, Hrant. Hello. Hi, Hrant. It has been two weeks now. The information that we have to cover is a lot, especially in the diplomatic front. We have had very information-filled two weeks and we didn't have an episode last week. Hrant, I wanted to get your thoughts on... Uh, what you're seeing uh, and what you're observing over this latest diplomatic activity. So starting with October 1st, we had Arat Mirzoyan visiting Iran, uh, Iran's foreign minister visiting Moscow and talking about Armenia. Uh, We had the Georgian prime minister visit. We had Pashinyan then meeting with Putin, the Indian prime minister coming to Armenia. And just today, I think we had a European special representative to the region visiting us. And of course, I think on the 14th, we also had um, our, uh, the Armenian and Azerbaijani foreign ministers uh, meeting for the second time in one month. A lot of things are happening, but we're not seeing a lot of information shared to the media. So there's just too much to analyze. But at a high level, what do you see uh, is happening in our region? Maybe you wanted to get your thoughts about this. It's right that uh, we don't uh, see much what is happening there because the process in, is generally close to the public and it's not very transparent, the diplomatic process. The first thing we should uh, understand that, especially after the last war, Armenia became a battleground for various diplomatic activities, for special services and so on, from various countries. Unfortunately, in many ways, Armenia is already uh, just a, a watcher here, but anyway, many countries and many forces are interested in being presented here. Another thing is that uh, there is informal process of negotiations between Armenia and Azerbaijan and Armenia and Turkey, uh, which has leaked after the Armenian PM's visit to Georgia. Mm-hmm. And uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, there is a process with Azerbaijan as well, which is uh, being held with a, one of the negotiators is uh, Armenia's current em- ambassador to Ukraine. Then there are many countries which are interested in being inside this process. And there are some countries which have been left out, like Iran, which uh, has found itself after after the war last year, found itself as being uh, left out and late to all of these discussions and um, found itself in a very unfriendly situation where Turkish influence is growing and Iran's influence is decreasing. That's why we see nervous reaction of Iran on Azerbaijani and Turkish activities in the region. All in all, we can see that uh, the region is very active right now, especially after the COVID pandemic. Generally, we see all of that in the world as well. We see active developments around Taiwan. We have observed uh, what happened in Afghanistan and uh, many other places as well. Syria is uh, most likely to be the next battleground again, uh, the north of Syria, northwest of Syria. So Armenia is just becoming another another area of, uh, of clash, of uh, diplomacy, of uh, spyware and so on. So we're seeing the clash of two essentially geopolitical ideas, the north-south corridor and the east-west corridor. You mentioned the negotiations with, uh, with Turkey that Armenia is having. Do you know any financial incentive for or what Armenia could expect in terms of any quantification of these corridors or these geopolitical ideas to Armenia financially? Or is it all political? And we should not basically not worry even about the finance because it's a political idea and someone is going to win. Uh, and what role does Armenia have? in this, you know, or even maybe qualitatively, which will be better for Armenia, both from political independence perspective and from a financial perspective, economic perspective? Uh, Of course, uh, every of uh, these 
dimensions, uh, directions have its own uh, financial aspects, uh, um, and we can try to quantify. There have been some calculations, although I don't think uh, focusing on the quantitative aspect is the uh, right way to go. I'll try to describe why. We have seen how uh, Lebanon has been the Middle Eastern uh, Switzerland because of its banking sector, because of its role in, uh, uh, let's say, all kind of negotiations, services, uh, and connection between East and West and so on. And last 50 years it's uh, slowly degrading and uh, it could be even in worst condition right now. The clashes are ongoing and so on. So, you can have a lot of financial benefits in one day and then you can uh, lose all it uh, and even more than you have gained uh, another day because of politics. And we have a lot of cases like this even in Armenia. So that's why there have been calculations. I can bring some data, for example, reopening border with Turkey has uh, been counted as uh, giving probably between 1 and 1.5 percent of additional GDP growth for Armenia. Mm -hmm. Although there, there would be qualitative changes as well, for example, changes in structure of trade. Uh, Turkey would replace partially at least uh, Georgia, Azerbaijan would replace Iran and so on. And, and thus it has a big uh, aspect of security, because uh, when, we, when we are talking about Azerbaijan, especially after the last year's war, we can see how Azerbaijan is trying to focus on the roads which are connecting Armenia to Iran and to Georgia. So it's already political. There have been tries to calculate the cost of uh, these uh, roads closed uh, between Armenia and Iran and so on, daily cost. And I, again, I think it's not very significant because anyway, if there is political decision or, or if there is political solution, you will gain gradual growth and vice versa. So. When we are talking about uh, big political changes, uh, economy does not work like uh, one penny to another and so on. It might change very very uh, drastically and very quick. Uh, so I think it's political. Uh, now concerning the um, projects for the region, east, west and north, south, in reality there are uh, several dimensions to north, northern, southern corridor because uh, we should distinguish south-north corridor between Russia and Iran, for example, and south-north corridor between Iran and Georgian ports, which are then directing the trade to the west, to the uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. And Iran is more interested, when we are talking about Armenia, in the functioning of, in reality, south to west corridor. Armenia was trying to also somehow stimulate this corridor, but it was very costly and Armenia was not able to to run it on its own and up until now we see the uh, south north highway being constructed and uh, it has been constructed only by like 10 to 15 percent uh, now concerning um, east to west corridor uh, it's uh, mainly functioning through georgia and georgia is a bit afraid of losing uh, all of incomes of its trade through uh, through georgia uh, between turkey and azerbaijan uh, but uh, what is being offered or what is being proposed to pass through Armenia uh, is a bit different thing. What is uh, being discussed around Armenia? It's uh, the uh, Mehri Corridor, or as Azerbaijan likes to call it, Zangezur Corridor, uh, trying to focus on Azerbaijanizing uh, toponyms of uh, southern Armenia. Now, this corridor is uh, very dangerous for Armenia. It's extremely dangerous from several points of view. First of all, uh, Azerbaijan has already created the Eastern Zangezur economic region, which implies that it has also a uh, Western Zangezur dimension and it uh, should be included in Azerbaijan. And uh, President Aliyev has already spoken about it. So they try to limit Armenia's sovereignty over Sunik and uh, put there as much effort as uh, possible, uh, increase their presence, including demographic presence. So whatever presence, wherever in Sunik, Azerbaijani and Turkish presence will 
increase uh, uh, it's very dangerous for Armenia and I don't think we should uh, see there any uh, any real financial benefits it's not about that so it's completely about security Hrant, we were talking with Pietro Shakarian and Benjamin Boosian a couple of weeks ago and we touched upon this so-called Zankizur corridor that Aliyev talks about all the time. The consensus was that at least for the time being, Aliyev's definition of a corridor is simply unfettered access to Armenian territory between Azerbaijan and Nakhichevan, uh, completely visa-free, customs-free, inspections-free, access for people and goods through Sunik and Gerarkunik. In exchange, of course, Armenia would get similar things uh, towards Russia and Iran. But they were not talking so much about sovereignty control. Do you agree or what's your view on this? I think sovereignty component is uh, more important here. First of all, because uh, according to November 9 or 10 agreement, uh, you could see that it's implied that uh, Russian special forces will be deployed there through the corridor. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at least those will not be Armenian. So it's already limiting Armenian sovereignty. Then concerning uh, passage of Armenian goods through Azerbaijan, to be frank, I don't believe that much because uh, nothing bothers Azerbaijan of reopening uh, borders like today. And if they are not doing so, I don't think they are interested in. And we have a long history of, uh, let's say, um, spoiled trade relations. I don't think uh, we are going to have any free access through Azerbaijani territory, neither free nor even uh, paid like with taxes and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think Azerbaijan wants one-sided control of uh, one-sided, let's say, passage and uh, limitation of Armenian control over Sunik. So that's, that's their objective. And also they are trying to switch the uh, focus of negotiations and, uh, and discussions from Artsakh to Sunik which they have effectively done because of also occupation of uh, Armenian territory which took place on since May 12th around Goris and Vartenis towns. So uh, I don't think it, it's, uh, it's much about economy, about uh, logistics, about transport, it's about uh, security. So you, you mentioned uh, structural changes to Armenian economy and I guess when you look at it from the east-west, and maybe you answered this already, but uh, when you compare the east-west and north-south, how disruptive would those each of those ideas be to Armenia's uh, economy, which so far has been very much focused on agrarian, supporting the farmer, and uh, you know, which I many people I, th I think don't see as a negative. You know, at least I don't see that as a big negative. But there's been talk that if the east-west corridor opens and cheap Turkish goods start flowing in, then this will be a threat to Armenia's agrarian economy. Is the same level of threat also you know coming to us from our southern neighbor? And uh, maybe or maybe am I, am I sort of thinking of this in the right way? Maybe you know are there are there other things that I should talk, think about besides just protectionism as an economic policy? I think uh, terms like protectionism or free market and so on are again politicized more than they should have been. In reality, we should think of what suits our economic needs right today or tomorrow and so on. Because uh, when analysts are focusing on these terms, it means uh, they let uh, discussions to be politicized. And I, don't, I, I want us to go away from this and to discuss what you have said uh, just before about the agrarian sector of Armenian economy. Mm -hmm. And I think it needs to be said the issue should be widened because it's not only about agriculture. Uh, I mean, in reality, there is there is real substantial threat to whole Armenian pro economy's productive sector because uh, apart from agriculture, we also have um, textile production or generally clothes, shoes production. Then we have, uh, let's say, some industry of uh, construction materials and other other light industries. So, mm -hmm. in this term, Turks are very competitive in this because of several reasons. One is that uh, Turkey has big market, including both Turkish market and also markets of neighboring countries, which is which it has uh, already been controlling to the uh, very significant uh, extent. Also, from a labor perspective, the economies of scale are greatly tipped in favor of Turkey versus yeah, the Caucasus. Then labor, so scale effect. Then 
we have issue of unfair competition from Turkish side because uh, Erdogan has already used several times uh, the tax system and uh, some other regulations to direct Turkish business to certain locations, to certain countries and to, let's say, conquer these markets, to expand to these markets and the goal has been to expand to the markets and not economic, again, it's a political goal and uh, Turkey has already had a, a rather a successful record of uh, of uh, this kind of expansions to to its neighborhood so in reality it's not only the issue that armenia might uh, face competition on its own market but also that it this competition will be unfair it's not that it might be unfair but uh, uh, i have no doubt that it will be unfair so i think with turkey we have a uh, big trouble here as well and also we should take into consideration the consequences. Okay, let's say Turks expanded to Armenian market and then they have uh, got some positions in trade, in, in production and so on. And then they uh, are already being able to have lobbying groups to buy more property, to have influence already on over political system and how they are going to use it. If, even in these conditions, uh, Armenia is being pressed by Turkey and Azerbaijan just from outside and add to that internal influence and it's already very hard to somehow stop it when it's needed and as of now we don't see any country which is uh, able to help Armenia in stopping Turkish influence from spreading so I think uh, if Armenia lets Turkish influence to spread in uh, in its borders it's, it, it will cause a big troubles in uh, short to mid-term perspective. All right, Herant, thank you very much. Moving forward to our next topic, which is about municipal election results from Tavush, Shirag, and Sunik. Over the past weekend, various cities in uh, three Armenian provinces, Shirag, Sunik, and Tavush, held municipal elections. The ruling civil contract party was only able to secure victories in some of these small towns, such as Delijan, as well as the Ter and Tatev communities in Sunik. That said, it lost in many of the larger and more strategic electoral battles, specifically Armenia's second largest city, Gyumri, as well as the southern cities of Goris and Merri. In Gyumri, the vote was plagued by a very low 24% voter turnout. Just over 26,000 of the eligible 109,000 voters cast the ballot. I will quickly read uh, some of the top winners because I have a question that's relevant about this. The Balasanian Alliance, supported by the incumbent mayor of Gyumri, Samvel Balasanian, won the election. Uh, civil contract came in second. Zartong National Christian Party was third. Republican Party of Armenia was fourth. And Abrelu Yergir actually cleared the threshold, the 5% threshold. In Goris, the Arushanian Alliance won. Civil contract was second. And Armenian National Congress was third. And in Merri, the Republican Party won. Uh, civil contract was number two, Liberal Party was three, and Abre Luyergir Party was also clearing the threshold. Our questions here are, who is the Balasanian Alliance in uh, Gyumri? Balasanian Alliance is a patronage network of the current mayor. It's not only him, it's, uh, let's say, a unity of uh, local elites, which has been ruling there at least for life last uh, seven to eight years. After the previous mayor, Vartan Hukasyan, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. was removed from his office due to some criminal cases connected to him. And now, it's noteworthy that uh, in these elections, administrative resource was excessively used by the current authorities, I mean the civil contract party, both in Sunik and in Chirac. Also, there have been uh, payments uh, to the people like social payments and so on and in reality uh, those payments should be considered as a pre-election bribe so if we are talking about uh, the perception of voters we don't see much support to the government mm -hmm. and also we don't see in reality much of competition because yes there were several uh, opposition parties in different regions of Armenia uh, but uh, mostly those were localized for example, Balasanyan Dashing is only present in Gyumri, 
while, for example, Arushanyan Alliance is only present in Goris. That's right. In Mehri, civil contract also lost, but the opposition parties which are there, they are very, let's say, constructive to the current government, so it's not about politics, it's more about local faces. Yeah, So and um, uh, just briefly, Aspet mentioned Republican Party. I just want to clarify that uh, the party that won in Mehri is Republic Party, which is Aram Zaveni Sarkisyan's party, not to be confused with the Republican Party of Armenia. True, true. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right, that's my mistake. Yeah, so generally, what we see is, uh, first of all, the local politics, where the current government is still weak, because when you talk about, let's say, a general set of ideas about state propaganda and about, uh, let's say, the perception of uh, future of the country, that's one thing, and their civil contract has proven to be strong on the election level, uh, which took place in June 20, 2021, I mean the uh, parliamentary election, but when we are talking about the specific phases, all those except to Pashinyan, civil contract, even with the usage of uh, uh, state resources, it's weak. That's why um, these elections were uh, in a way uh, significant for uh, the political landscape of Armenia. Many people are now analyzing what happened. They are trying to compare these elections to June 20 elections. Many say that uh, this proves that it's not that um, Nikol Pashinyan was strong, but it's more that um, opposition was weak. And in a way it is correct. Uh, some say it's uh, because people did not want to elect uh, Kocharyan and Ser Sarkisyan. Maybe this is right. I'm not completely sure. But at least all those uh, opposition alliances were very weak in presenting to people the alternative model of development. You mean now, the opposition that's represented in the parliament, right? True, true. Yeah. Uh, now, now, concerning the current uh, local elections, we see that on the first hand, the participation rate was low. But it's not a very big deal because uh, low participation rate is okay when we are talking about uh, local uh, when we are talking about local elections. And even what is even more important is that even those uh, opposition uh, alliances like uh, Balasanyan or Arushanyan alliance, they have not been holding extensive support campaign. So it's not that they won. It's more that uh, civil contract has lost. So this is uh, the general context about these elections. Uh, and concerning villages, those were not very competitive. A, a quick question about this one party, Abrelu Yergir, that cleared uh, the threshold both in the north and the south. Who are they? This party includes several politicians from the Bright Armenia Party mm -hmm. and then some other politicians and public figures. And generally, it's connected to Ruben Vartanyan from uh, Russia, Interesting. who has financed uh, Tatev Wings. And he's uh, already last five years, he's trying to somehow enter Armenian politics. And all of Armenian authorities were always trying to stop him from doing that somehow. And he was always very cautious in, uh, let's say, not getting into direct confrontation mm -hmm. because he is business person not politician in the uh, very direct way so he was always trying to do it in a non-conflict manner and now he is trying to step his first um, to make his first steps also there are several NGOs connected to him enterprises so he is trying to find a path into Armenian politics Harant, uh, you talked about this briefly but I do want to compare uh, Gyumri, specifically the Gyumri election results of June 2021. I believe Gyumri was the highest, it received the highest support for Pashinyan during those elections, uh, or civil contracts specifically. And the elections now, which in which civil contract got only 30% or 29.6%. Um, do you see this uh, as a change in voter preferences, or is this... You know, is there some other explanation for this major difference in, in voting? Uh, Gyumri was not the highest uh, in uh, June 2021, although the current ruling party got there much more than it was expected. Maybe that's why you remembered it. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, it got uh, 
around uh, a bit less than 60% if I'm not mistaken, should be checked. Anyway, uh, the ruling party got there a lot of votes. There are several uh, things which happened. First of all, the inflation rate, in, uh, I mean the price index, has increased significantly in the last four months and uh, it's already creating problems for ruling party as well because officially inflation rate is as of now it's nine uh, percent with up to 15 percent the uh, grocery inflation let's say so it's already a problem right. for those who have low incomes and especially it's felt in Gyumri and in some other areas which are uh, let's say it's specially felt in minor urban areas those which are not Yerevan and those which are not rural and uh, there it's affecting already the ruling party's uh, approval rate another thing is that uh, there is no Robert Kochan on this election so probably for people in uh, June 2021 it was still important to not be proven to, to have been wrong in 2018 so it's not so much about voting against Kocharyan but it's about voting for their previous uh, let's say decision of uh, supporting of uh, Velvet Revolution back in 2018 so what I observe is that people don't want to be wrong there that's why they supported Pashinyan against Kocharyan uh, but uh, since there is no Kocharyan anymore this time they did not do that so since it's a localized story and since there has have not been a lot of discussions on uh, a national level a uh, very passive uh, election campaign there was no Pashinyan in this campaign many people did not uh, connect it directly to Pashinyan or at least uh, to Pashinyan vs uh, previous regime, let's say this uh, dichotomy, which has played uh, played its role in the previous elections, and, and we don't know how many percentage uh, the ruling party would get if Pashinyan was involved in the elections, right. because uh, the sociology in Armenia is not very transparent and qualitative lately. And I wanted to ask you, while we're on Gyumri, do you have any sense of the political loyalties of the Balasanyan Alliance uh, and Sambal Balasanyan? Granted, yes, he's not a you know, civil contract, but there have been rumors that he may actually go into a coalition with civil contract. And just the fact that he has been able to stay in power in Gyumri for so long led some people to speculate that he may have some kind of a agreement with Pashinyan in terms of what to do in Gyumri. What are your thoughts about this aspect? Uh, there is the same discussion about Goris as well. There are rumors that uh, some people in a uh, uh, civil contract in uh, Goris were glad with Arushanyan's victory as well. So it should not be excluded that there is some informal agreement be between these uh, local alliances and the current ruling party. Uh, at least Balasanyan has a record of supporting a Republican Party in 2016. To some extent, even maybe not him personally, but some of his network, even in 2021. Uh, but uh, civil contract also is uh, very, uh, let's say, very quick to respond to such developments. So they can try to negotiate. They can try to find the find the solution to the to the situation where they have lost the elections. So theoretically, this uh, coalition might be formed. Although I cannot uh, speculate if there is currently any agreement or not. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that it's interesting how other uh, subjects of of the election process will behave i mean the minor parties which are also entering the gyumri uh, city hall uh, i think we should observe uh, how it will develop yeah I, after all i guess so one one tool in the tool set of the ruling government as it has been i guess in, in the past too but even more pronounced you know in the pashinya during the pashinya regime has been the prospect of launching criminal prosecution. For instance, it should be uh, noteworthy to it's noteworthy to mention that Arush Arushanyan Alliance, led by Arush Arushanyan, you know, won 
despite the leader of the alliance being in jail, uh, in pre-trial custody. What I wanted to mention is that even before the elections, I believe the day before the election, there was a lot of police pressure against the alliance. I believe they arrested his father. And the similar sort of tactics, I think, exist uh, have, have been noticed in, in, in other regions in Armenia. Do you have any comments on this? And do you think that this tactic of... Well, right know, after you know, the June is... elections, uh, the civil contract party went after a lot of the mayors, especially in the South, right. who were um, supporters of the opposition, right? So this is yeah. a result of, I won't call it a purge, but basically that uh, entire movement against all the mayors who supported the opposition. Right, right. it's more connected to the, uh, to the uh, parliamentary elections than the current uh, local elections. Uh, although, maybe when they were starting these persecutions, uh, maybe they had into account that uh, the local elections will occur in several months and try to secure the situation there before the elections. But mainly, yes, it's connected to the parliamentary elections. And in general, uh, and I'll ask one more question, but that, this will be my last one today. Uh, in general, uh, how important are municipal elections for, I guess, from a national perspective? You know, what kind of leverage does this give a ruling party and why is for instance civil contract interested uh, or maybe maybe they weren't interested and that's why they didn't put a lot of effort uh, but what's at stake in these elections I guess uh, good question I think these elections have only symbolic meaning although this symbolic meaning could be big theoretically but it won't be probably because as far as what I see on our media landscape opposition did not play this card so in reality this has only symbolic meaning why it is so it's because uh, since late 90s in Armenia the local self-governance system has changed uh, to the way it's uh, let's say the most taxes are collected centrally to the Yerevan and then redirected to the to the provinces to the uh, towns and villages so the regions are highly dependent on Yerevan and self-government units are highly dependent on the central government. So in reality the main battle has already occurred and this uh, will not affect uh, the situation. Even if the toughest opposition would uh, win these elections, even this would not change much. Yeah, that sort of confirmed my, my suspicions. Harant? A year ago, we routinely discussed the COVID situation in Armenia, but we haven't talked much in the past few months. We're currently going through what may be a seasonal upswing globally, not just in Armenia for the virus. The most recent data that I've seen in the country's vaccination stats is that 588,000 vaccine shots have been dispensed, 185,000 people have received two doses, and around 400,000 people have received a single shot so far. In general, what is your current impression on the course of the vaccination process in Armenia and the fight against COVID? Yeah, we are passing through the fourth wave of COVID right now, which is by its scale already compar comparable to the second wave, which took place exactly a year ago. Concerning the combat against COVID, well, uh, there is ongoing vaccination process. As, as you said, we have mm, 185,000 people who got two doses. Yes. So generally we have, let's say, 6 uh, to 7 percent of population immunized and uh, fully immunized, let's say, by vaccines. Although uh, we should note that uh, Delta stain is uh, being less affected by the vaccines than the previous stains because those vaccines were generally designed against the uh, alpha stain. But anyway, 6% uh, and even if uh, we count the 20% who got just one, uh, one dose mm -hmm. is uh, not enough for, for having uh, full, full herd immunity or anything like that. Yeah, herd immunity. We have, uh, based on my uh, calculations, we have about 40% who contacted the virus, I mean, uh, 
not via vaccination, but via the, let's say, just got the virus. Uh, just got COVID. Natural infection. Last year yes. and a half. Yeah, just got the infection. Natural immunity. Mm. Uh, yeah, and uh, we can expect that uh, some of them, majority of them, still have the immunity. Uh, but there is a big question whether these people who got who got the vaccine. Uh, had contacted the virus before or those did not have any immunity. So uh, generally it might appear that some people who are getting the vaccine, uh, they uh, had already some level of immunity. So it's a big question whether we can uh, add up all these numbers uh, to each other or not. But anyway, since we see the virus spreading, it means that the herd immunity has not been achieved. Haran, to, to me, it's to... really important to understand because uh, the vaccination rates are so low in Armenia still. What are the major obstacles to vaccination in Armenia? Is it cultural? Is it access to a uh, vaccine? Is it some other variable that comes into play? From what I know, the access to vaccine uh, is not limited in Armenia. I mean, if people want, they can get a vaccine. Although um, I have heard that uh, some people want to get only Sputnik and it's, uh, it's not available mm -hmm. in many cases. But it's not a, only about that. In many cases, people just do not trust the vaccination process because of, first of all, because of conspiracy theories which have been sp being spread since uh, the March last year. And not only that, the very circumstance that it's uh, only, uh, let's say, that it's very new. And uh, people in Armenia, probably it's also cultural, because people in Armenia sometimes do not trust things which are very new. And that's why they say, we want to avoid it. Even those who are in the risk group, even those people uh, sometimes mm, avoid vaccination. So it's both cultural and information issue and uh, many other issues and also uh, the and also the fact that the mass vaccination has not uh, proved uh, sh which also should be uh, discussed uh, has not proved a very high rate of success because we also have uh, high rates of uh, infection in the US and in, in Israel despite the fact that they got really good success in, in vaccination process. So so it's mixed, I would say, but generally cultural. I have a, a question to both you and uh, Hovi, to both of you, since you live in Yerevan. Have you noticed if the government has a major initiative, a PR campaign, to try and convince people to uh, help them trust the vaccines? Uh, for example, the kind of campaigns that they have run over the last 20 years for anti-smoking, to help people quit smoking and such things. Is there such, something like that, something similar uh, to help people overcome their uh, concerns about the vaccines? In reality, even anti-smoking campaign in Armenia was very passive during the last uh, decades and have not been very successful. The same can be said about uh, vaccination. There is a try to force people getting vaccinated and there is an initiative to uh, force people either pass tests once in a week. Right now they are being forced to pass tests once in two weeks, mm -hmm. but then, then there are plans to switch to once in a week testing or to get vaccinated. But people sometimes even leave their working places not to... Uh, getting uh, forced uh, to be vaccinated and concerning the information campaign I don't see very active information campaign authorities avoid uh, being associated with this topic very much from what I have seen so I think authorities are trying to have a vaccinating campaign but at the same time not having it uh, let's say connected to their image because in Armenia it's not very popular. And I'd like to add, I guess, uh, having now been here for uh, 
uh, a little while and seen things. And I say this as a fully vaccinated person. I think that the, the current strategy of the authorities in Armenia, it's, it's always about fear, right? You know, uh, yes, there is there is complete absence in terms of sharing information and explaining why it is good to be vaccinated. But now we hear the threat to even actually charge people money for healthcare if they don't get vaccinated. So there's this rumor about 800, well, not a rumor, like the authorities have said that if, if this uh, load on the health system continues, that they will pass a law to force people to pay out of their own pocket for their health care if they don't get vaccinated. And even the current program, which is driven through employment, so it puts the burden on the employers to demand that employees either get vaccinated or uh, demand to see a certificate of a negative PCR test once a week. Uh, right now it's twice a month, but they want to change it to once a week. But you know, I, I just want to mention that the target for this is healthy people who can go to work, whereas the, the people who would benefit most from vaccination are people who are retired, people who are aged, people who actually cannot work because of their health conditions. And those people are being left out of this program. So even this method of forcing people to get vaccinated in the easiest way possible for the government, because you know they, it doesn't require much on them, they shift the burden on the employers, which is horrible in my opinion. Even this easy fix in their minds is um, not targeted, and I don't think will have the desired effect because it's not reaching the people that really need to be vaccinated. My personal opinion also, since uh, Hanan mentioned it, uh, yes, there are conspiracy theorists, but there are also sort of legitimate concerns about mandatory vaccination of everyone. Uh, and I don't think that the level of those objections is very different from that in the West. What I see is diff different from the West in, in Armenia is the complete absence of government education of, of the benefits of vaccination. And um, yeah, that is, the, that is the reality. So more of that is required, I think. All right. Um, thank you for both of your perspectives. That was very informative. Hovik, did you have any final comments you wanted to get off your chest? Yes, uh, we actually planned on discussing these topics uh, in more detail, but um, you know it's it's very discouraging because you know essentially th there were two major incidents last week that really need to be covered. Uh, one was a shootout in Artsakh, where based on official information, six of our soldiers got injured. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, wounded, and two of them seriously. And, Exactly. And uh, there are so many different reports, uh, such as, you know, one report said that uh, the positions, uh, our positions have been ca captured by Azerbaijan. This was the first confirmed, I believe, use of attack drones by Azerbaijan in Artsakh as well. But the numbers of the deaths, or, or you know, there, there were even like reports of deaths, but which have been denied officially. The difficulty arises where we have very little information. And unfortunately, we cannot trust much of these information you know will, can you trust the, the the ministry of defense which had for 44 days been telling us that we were winning or we're going to win and we you know led, leading to the capitulation on november 9th can we trust the various you know people such as uh Arturun and and so forth who are speaking uh in the name of the sort of the authorities the i think i believe the only one we could trust and the only thing information that we can relay was that in artsakh according to the hr ombudsman of armenia uh there were six wounded too heavily and there were no changes in terms of positions but up to the day we have not been able to get a final confirmation of that so it's worthwhile to keep looking out for new information on that and we will uh, inform you next week if this uh, situation changes and just today there were two different sources one was Nairi Hohikyan who is a journalist and the other is Anna Grikorian from the opposition Armenia uh, Alliance uh, who mentioned Pela Sar which is in Armenia which is in Armenia according to Soviet maps according to current maps and so forth and there have been reports that Pelasar, the heights on Pelasar, our positions have been ceded to Azerbaijan. Basically the report by Anna uh, Grigorian is that uh, Armenian forces have uh, withdrawn and Azerbaijani forces have taken over that spot which is a very strategic location. Uh, obviously this is very troubling and we don't know how whether this is 100% true 
but unfortunately just like the 44 day war we can only convey this information and ask that you as a listener be on the lookout for the truth in any way you can because obviously it's very difficult to get the truth from the government <laughs> so that's i got that off my chest okay we're gonna leave it there for today thank you everyone i appreciate your time thank you thank you Okay, that was our Week in Review show, and we hope it helped you catch up with some of the issues in and around Armenia from this past week. As always, we invite your feedback and your suggestions. You can find us on most social media and podcast platforms or our website, groom.org. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on YouTube, like our pages, and follow us on social media. On behalf of everyone in this episode, we wish you a good week. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.